Okay. Are we live? Inshallah. Yes. Uh, can you write me? Are we live? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم أما بعد رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأمة من لسان يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا فتاه يا علي مفتح لنا فتح قريبا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اتباعه وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد السلام عليكم everyone and thank you for joining us again oh, earlier we had some technical problems with the live stream and alhamdulillah we are back we want to be discussing this really very very crucial critical and interesting topic of al aqsa the al aqsa attacks and uh, the false uh, messiah and uh, what exactly we're going to be attempting to do is it's going to be a critical Islamic an analysis of the ethnic cleansing of Muslims in the Holy Land, unfortunately. And that and this, this particular event, whatever is happening in the Holy Land today and has been happening for 70 years now, is by far one of the biggest, most critical events that is going to usher in the last hour. And what do we mean by that? You can see uh, the fact that we have the false Messiah in the topic. That is the critical, the central part of our discussion. So let's start, Bismillah. The contents of our discussion, and let's keep this here, uh, are firstly the a Quran centric approach. So in our analysis, we are going to use, of course, the Quran, but it's going to be like the center of all of our discourse on the subject. And we're going to go into why and how it's not. Unfortunately, uh, we don't see much of this. We see much of, you know, every sort of analysis but we don't see this sort of a breakdown, a Quran centric analysis of whatever is happening in the Holy Land and with Muslims in general. The critical importance of Islamic eschatology. Now, for those of you who are not aware of what eschatology is, eschatology is ilmul akhiru zaman, and I'm going to define that, inshallah. Now, why is Israel doing this? So th that's the question. Why, why would somebody do that? Why are they doing this? Why is this happening to uh, you know the Muslims there? And why are the Muslims surrounding that area, they are also undergoing a lot of you know, oppression. Since the fall of the Khilafah in the 1920s, the Muslim world has undergone serious uh, you know, events, unfortunate events of, of torture, of oppression, and of absolute anarchy. And we want to analyze why should something like that happen. So we're going to go into a brief history of the Jewish people, which is very central. How can we understand what's happening in the Holy Land when we don't understand, uh, you have a basic understanding of the Jewish people and their history? And then, of course, the Jal, the false Messiah. We'll have to reel in this subject necessarily the moment we start with an analysis. The 40 days of the Jal. There is a hadith that goes into that, but maybe we may not be able to get that in this discussion. Uh, in the next discussion, inshallah, we're going to go into detail. And then the end of history and the victory of Islam. Some basic terminology that's going to be used for those of you who are not really uh, aware of uh, the things that, you know, political terminology, like, for example, Zionism. What is Zionism or uh, the way we say Zionists? Uh, it's a 19th century political movement that sought to bring Jews back to the Holy Land. So uh, the Holy Land, then what is ho the Holy Land? In the Quran, it's called Ardul Muqaddasa, the Holy uh, land and this is the whole area of Palestine uh, 
Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem is at its heart. So this political movement that sought to bring Jews back uh, to this holy land, because the, uh, they lived in the holy land, 2000 years back and this political movement to get them back from the whole world that is called zionism and lastly islamic eschatology that is going to be the core of our discussion the lens through which we're going to analyze this event is the branch of islamic studies that deals with the final events of history so the end times as we know it so all of the hadith and the quranic ayah that talk about the last hour the signs of the last hour and whatever is going to you know occur uh, before the end so there's uh, the end of history and there's the end of the world. We're not talking about the end of the world. We are talking about the end of history. What is the end of history? The end of history, and we're going to go into that uh, in a bit, uh, just to give you a brief uh, definition. The end of history is that you have rival claims to truth. You have many religions and many belief systems. And all religions and belief systems say that they are the truth. But the end of history would be uh, a validation of the claim of truth of one of the, the belief systems. So the end of history, however, uh, humanity, as in the last period of, of humanity, wherein we see who was the who was the truest, basically, who was truth, who had the truth with them, which belief system was a true belief system. So that is the end of history. That is how history will end. Or are we going to see who are the people who then established this truth throughout the world? So that is the end of history. It's different from the end of the world. Uh, that's a different thing. We're talking about the end of history. Like, for example, for us then, Muslims, the end of history, the final event, climax of that event, is uh, the return of the Messiah, uh, Isa alayhi salam, the son of Mary. That is the final uh, event. That is going to prove that Islam was right and Islam was the truth all along. Okay, so just to give you a brief introduction, uh, unfortunate events that are taking place in uh, the Holy Land, and especially uh, from the past few weeks, unimaginable oppression committed by the Israeli population over Muslims living in the Holy Land. And you have to understand, you know, uh, there's oppression on Muslims throughout, uh, throughout the world. And uh, there, some communities are more oppressed than the others, but we have to say there's oppression. Here, there's a two factor, there's absolutely unimaginable oppression like children literally are being targeted. And then the other side of the problem is that this is holy, this is holy land. We consider this place very holy. Uh, it's the third most holiest after the two Haramain, Mecca and Medina. Jerusalem is very dear to uh, Muslims. And we know the reasons why, because this was the first Qibla, uh, the early Muslims, the earliest of Muslims for 17 months prayed uh, uh, for 17 months in Medina and 10 years in Makkah. So that's a lot of time. They pay, played, paid towards uh, Jerusalem, towards Al-Aqsa uh, Mosque, and also the Prophet Sallallahu uh, amazing journey, the night journey uh, happened from uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And there's so many other things, like there's not an inch of that land where a prophet has not walked or an angel has not descended. That is very blessed land and every inch of that land you know is is almost a memoir of uh, a prophet of a servant of god of a friend of god so that is a very holy uh, place for muslims for uh, jews as well as christians but unfortunately we see gross uh, you know manifestations of oppression Palestinian Muslims thus are denied basic rights. They're subjected to ethnic cleansing, occupation. I mean, imagine you're sitting in your house and somebody comes over and just demolishes that house and uh, you know robs you of your right to that place, um, constructs their own house there, and that's it. Kills your family members and literally leaves you homeless, uh, jobless, of course, and even you know without your family killed you killed uh, your family in front of your own eyes 
we can't even imagine the kind of oppression that there is. I mean, uh, I can tell you, I'm from Kashmir, so we can, I can really understand what these people, they go through. Now, attacks on the holiest site in the world, which is the Al-Aqsa compound. And this is like, you know, almost like, God forbid, God forbid, just imagine somebody would come and uh, desecrate uh, the Kaaba or the Masjid al-Haram or kill the Hujjaj, people who are doing Hajj. That's unimaginable. The whole Muslim world will go crazy. We'll, even women and children will defend it. That's what, that is exactly what's happening in uh, the Al-Aqsa compound uh, a few weeks back. And it's been happening for 70 years. Worst affected in all uh, crises are women and children. And there's a peculiar, you know, sort of this, they have this peculiar uh, thing to their uh, oppression that they directly uh, sort of harm and attack children as if they do this purposefully, uh, they uh, literally shoot children, and which is, which is appalling, which is heart-wrenching. So, but despite all of this, we see the strongest civilian resistance of Muslims in this region. Despite all of this, we see like the most beautiful, the most you know, strong uh, manifestation of resistance of Muslims, spiritual resistance, physical resistance uh, in this area. Now, the, you know, there we've been, because it's been going on for 70 years, this issue, and it's been almost like a dagger in the heart of Islam. But all we see, and especially, I mean, uh, the last few uh, weeks, all we've seen, if you've been reading the news or on social media, is what? Solidarity. And mashallah, alhamdulillah, we can say no matter how much solidarity we may show towards this cause and towards these people who are resisting with their hearts and their souls and their lives, their bodies, their families, everything that they have, uh, protecting themselves and the holy uh, you know, uh, place, the holy land. With all of the solid solidarity, we can say no matter how much solidarity that there is, it will never be enough. But there has to be another side. What is missing is an analysis. So uh, what do I mean by an analysis? Like people, of course, worldwide, we've been seeing even non-Muslims, uh, many secular people have, uh, and celebrities, political figures, they've expressed solidarity with the Palestinian people. But what, we need as a religious community, we uh, are Muslims, we are a religious community, we require an Islamic analysis of the events that are taking place. So uh, because primarily we are a religious community, we want to know what the Quran said about this, we want to know what the Prophet said about this. And that is something that is absolutely missing. And that is the job of the Islamic scholarship. Unfortunately, we don't see any of that, that. We just see a lot of solidarity. And I think, you know, I think to myself, you have people like Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, the football player, or Bella Hadid, uh, who's, uh, you know, uh, Gigi Hadid's sister, the singer, I think. And who else? Uh, you know, so many people, uh, so many celebrities uh, who have been told, is Zayn Malik, uh, another singer, they have been showing solidarity towards this cause and towards whatever has been happening towards the Palestinian people. But then you have Islamic scholars also showing solidarity. So is there no difference between Bella Hadid and Zayn Malik and a scholar who has been educated for years and years studying the Quran, studying Arabic, studying, you know, tafsir, studying fiqh, and all that you can do is just show solidarity like Zayn Malik and Bella Hadid, that's all. If that is what your scholarship can give you, then sit, I mean, there's no difference, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Because 
so scholarship is supposed to give you a very holistic view on whatever is happening in the world, and especially if it is religious scholarship. So we are not looking for a historical or a secular analysis, something that we can get from the History Channel, something that we can get from maybe a TV show in Al Jazeera. We are looking for an Islamic analysis from the Quran. And unfortunately, you don't find that with Islamic scholars. And the primary reason being the impact of secularism on our thinking process. We don't think like Muslims or Muslim students of knowledge or Muslim scholars. We think just like Trevor Noah from you know uh, a TV show or any other you know uh, his, uh, his historian or uh, analyst on a, a prime time TV show. We don't. We are not using the Quran to understand this great event, this very critical event in our history. Primarily because there is this inherent, maybe I'm you know, speculating because maybe uh, what people are thinking, at least with our scholars and with students of knowledge uh, from the Islamic community is maybe they're thinking, how can a seventh century book explain a 21st century political issue? This is the core problem. That is why we don't have, we have a lot of solidarity, very little analysis. And solidarity does not require scholarship. It just requires you to be human. You just have to be a human being to show solidarity with the Palestinian people, with the Kashmiri people, with the Chinese uh, Muslims, with whoever, with the Rohingya Muslims, anywhere there is oppression. You don't need to be a scholar, but if you are a scholar or a student of knowledge, or you know some bit of uh, Islam, that's, you need to give an analysis and not the analysis that you can get from a history channel, an Islamic analysis from the lens of the Quran. So what does that, that look like? What does an analysis look like? This is the why question. You see, we're living in very, very, interesting times and very difficult times where the question why, whenever you ask the question why, it's actually discarded. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's considered unnecessarily or unnecessary or maybe a product of evolution. Like why should we, you ask the question why? So why was the world created? Why was the human being created? Why, the why is all is a problematic statement. And the most convenient thing that the modern secular mind does is just, let's just ignore that. Let's not talk about this. If we can't, you know, uh, understand this, uh, if we cannot answer this, let's just pretend that it's not there. But that's not how a religious mind, uh, a uh, religious community thinks. The why is the center. It's with the why that you can understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his role in history. The why is the central question. You can get the how and the what from anyone, but the why you can only get from Al-Haq. So why did this happen? Why is this happening in one of the holiest uh, you know, uh, locations on the planet? The establishment of the state of Israel. We're going to go into uh, this, this particular thing. Why should the state of Israel be established in the first place? Because Historically, we know that it has been 2000 years, not a joke, 2000 years since the state of Israel was completely demolished. The people, the Jewish people were exiled. And according to their own narrative, it was God. It was divinely, you know, uh, it, it was a divine event, this expulsion and the destruction of uh, the temple of Solomon. We're gonna go into that. The abolition of the Islamic Khilafah, why should the Khilafah be abolished? Why should something like this happen? And the crisis in the Islamic world. Then of course, the analysis would entail us to ask the question, how should we address this then? I mean, if we know all of this now, next step is how do we address this? How do we deal with this? And then also the future. What does the future hold for the Ummah? Because when you believe in, a religion, you are inside, you believe in a belief system, which is a religion, you need to know 
what you need to have a holistic picture of how the past was, how the present can be, uh, you know, corrected and perfected, and what does the future hold on to? That is essentially the core part of being part of a religious community. We have a full holistic picture of the flow of time. We're going to go get into that, inshallah. So let me let me just shift it here. Can I? Yeah. So why is an Islamic analysis crucial? Why is it even required? There are various reasons for it. The first one is, I mean, we have, uh, this is by far one of the most violent, one of the most difficult period uh, in Islamic history. And it's getting more and more worse by the day. You have death and destruction uh, within the community. Uh, Muslims all throughout the world fa are facing the worst uh, amount of, of oppression, of violence, name it. So it, there, there is this threat to life. So why should... The, uh, an analysis is needed so as to address why should something like this happen. Uh, like the Prophet ﷺ, he said that there would be excessive killing in the last age. There would be epidemics, there would be man-made and natural disasters. So that should entail an analysis. You have a global impoverishment especially the, the poorest countries in the world happen to be Muslim countries that's also written in uh, various hadiths. You have spiritual and religious tribulations, which is the worst. So it's getting worse from a physical, like from physical uh, you know, a tribulation, people dying, to economic tribulation, people being poor, economically enslaved. But this is something for a religious minded person or a religious community, this is the worst, because this tribulation means an end to the dunya as well as the hereafter. A religious community thrives on uh, a vision of the hereafter, a vision of the future. Even if things are wrong right now in my life, inshallah, they will be better in the hereafter. Inshallah, I will get a reward from a merciful Lord in the hereafter. But if that is destroyed, the hereafter is destroyed, that's it, that's the end of a religious person as well as a community. So we have a person would be a believer in the morning and turn into a disbeliever by evening. So that should tell you the gravity, the weight of the tribulations that they're going to be on, uh, you know, during this period, which we uh, call the last age. Should this not entail an Islamic analysis of events, of historical events? Of course, I mean, this is how serious it is. Then you have a complete nation enslaved. So all of these could be individual uh, tribulations, people individually being, uh, you know, uh, dying, being impoverished. Uh, facing spiritual religious tribulations, but then as a whole, uh, Ummah as a whole, we are facing the worst uh, kinds of tribulations and trials today. And the Prophet ﷺ talked about this when he said that nations will gather to attack you like people gather around a table and call on each other to eat. So that is, that is exactly, I mean, the moment you talk about, uh, you, you, uh, you know, read that hadith, you have a picture of NATO and, you know, uh, nations sitting around round table conferences or the UN deciding on the fate of Muslim, uh, the Muslim community, the Muslim world. Now, just to get a perspective of what we are talking about, why are we insisting on an analysis. Why do we need an analysis? Of course, those reasons are there. But then let's just get a perspective of what an analysis actually looks like. Uh, so you have a rat, <laughs> uh, there, a mouse, and the perspective of an uh, animal is very, very limited. It's just they live in the now. They don't think about, okay, let me save this for tomorrow, or let me, you know, save this for my children day after, or 
like that. Animals live for the moment. And that's precisely maybe because of uh, the consciousness that they have. They are not self-conscious, they are just conscious. And there are other things to that. But then uh, for a human being, a human being has a perspective, a sort of a feeling about the past, can remember the past as well as the future. So can plan for the future, can uh, introspect on the past. And that is how a human being is different from animals. Then you have something like a secular analysis, which is something that you can get from your university degree or just watching even a show on history channel on the history channel, which is past events, future events, be it cosmological events or historical events, they are all lined up. And this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and that's it. This is data information. Why did this happen? Maybe because this happened, the one that was earlier, that's why that led to this. But a full, a holistic picture, something that makes sense, uh, that is missing in, uh, a sec in secular analysis of history as well as the universe, because, you know, that that angle of making sense, of, of understanding the purpose, that is in itself missing. But when it comes to an Islamic analysis, this is what an Islamic analysis is all about. Whether it's true or not, that is a different thing. You know, whether it's true or not, that will be proved when we go into the analysis and we show how beautifully the Prophet and the Quran explains our reality today. But what is Islamic analysis? An Islamic analysis is essentially from pre-eternity till post-eternity, all what is going to happen and all that is going to be, you know, the destiny of mankind is out there. And this is all a part, it's a holistic picture, a very comprehensive picture of the destiny of mankind, the destiny of the entire universe from pre-eternity before and till post-eternity. So imagine, uh, you know, the vastness and the width of this uh, sort of an analysis. So all of that, anal uh, the prior analysis, be it the analysis of a rat or a human being, and all of the secular analysis, which is, you know, which uh, with today's, you know, modern universities, you have specialized fields uh, in, in history, in science, all of that knowledge is literally like a tiny dot on this whole Islamic analysis, this timeline, a tiny little dot on that. And that is how powerful an Islamic analysis is. But do our scholars understand that or do they appreciate that? That we'll have to discuss. So the methodology that we are going to use in our study and our analysis of this event and generally with our organization, no, is this one verse, which just explains everything, which is how to view the world through the lens of the Quran. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, chapter 16, Surah Nahal, he says, and we sent down the book as an explanation and clarification of all things. All things mean all things from the beginning of time till the end of time everything. So there you have it. The Quran is itself making this very grand and grandiose claim, which it is ready to, you know, uh, accept any challenge. And it's making this claim that it can explain everything, everything. So if you're looking for an analysis, an Islamic analysis, the Quran starts with this prior claim that it can explain everything. So everything means everything in the past and everything in the future. When we go to past events, let's say historical events, let's say, you know, the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, what that would in, uh, entail uh, if we want to take the Quran and understand the past would be an analysis of history, maybe a moral or an ethical, a holistic reading of historical and cosmological events as well. So the, his, the, the 
uh, you know, the evolution of the universe or the flow of history from one empire to another. That's the moment you apply the Quran to that, that's what you're going to get. And it's going to be very holistic. And well, people have attempted that and very beautifully. Early Muslims were very, you know, this wasn't something which was, you know, taught to them. Uh, they knew it default that yes, of course, the Quran explains everything. And that's why the Quran was central to much of their discourse. Now we've forgotten that. About future events. Now, these are all the events that are going to happen after the Prophet So all of those events till the end of time, when we apply the Quran, we would necessarily have to include and, you know, uh, literally introduce this branch of study, Ilmul Akhir Zaman or Islamic eschatology. So all of the ayat and all of the hadith that talk about the end times, all of the tribulations, all of the events that are going to happen after the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi and till the end of time. And the companions, they knew, they understood this, this power of the Quran. It is, you know, it uh, it was a, a it is a seventh century book, but it's not limited to the seventh century. That is the miracle of the Quran. When uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he write, he says, when you intend to acquire knowledge, deeply study the Quran, for in it lies the principles of knowledge of the ancients as well as future generations. This is one of the most important uh, commentators of the Quran and a very close companion of the Prophet Sallallahu He understood, they all understood the power of the Quran. That's why they used the Quran. And that's what we need to introduce. And inshallah, we're going to see that like in real time. Okay. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do this. Now, the miracle of the Quran. Now let's go into how the how and the why uh, of this methodology that we are going to be using in an analysis of the events uh, surrounding uh, Jerusalem. But first we need to understand, get our base and our foundation ready. This is our foundation. That the miracle of the Quran is that while it is a book that was revealed in the seventh century, so it is, you know, in that sense, a temporal event, the revelation of the Quran in that sense uh, when we speak but it can explain all events that took place since the beginning of time as well as all events that will take place till the end of time that is the miracle of the Quran so all claims rival claims sorry Rival claims and the test of time. So the way I'm speaking, this is a claim, essentially, is it not? It is a claim. And while, while we as Muslims have this claim, there are other belief systems also that have rival claims. But then who is going to or what is going to judge between all of these claims? Uh, here, because we are using the lens of Islamic eschatology, we can openly and very confidently say it is the test of time. It would be time itself that will choose between rival claims that which claim, which belief system was the truth. Because they can't all be true. They're all very different. And they're all sometimes even negating each other. So certainly can't be true. There has to be one rival claim, uh, one claim to truth, one truthful claim. And that is going to be proved by the test of time. So you have, for example, Hindu scriptures. Even atheism in itself is a belief system. You have to believe in this, that there is nothing to it. It's all random. Or a, a Christianity or Judaism or uh, you know, Chinese traditions. So all belief systems, they make claims of truth. But only one belief system's claim will be validated. And how would that be done? And absolute validation will occur through the test of time. The passage of time is central to this validation. Only time will be able to tell that which claim was the truth. And how that's going to happen? 
So you have a claim. Let's say the, uh, the, with the Quran, we have a claim. What's going to happen is a passage of time. But it has to be coupled with an analysis. If you don't talk about it, if you don't uh, discuss it, how are you going to even verify that claim? So that that is directed to um, you know scholarly, the, the Muslim uh, scholarship especially, and people and students of knowledge who are studying Islam. That there has to be an analysis over a passage of time. Then only can that there be a validation. So as we move further and further ahead in time, this claim of the Quran, let's say the grandiose claim that it can explain all things, this particular claim of the Quran will be validated and many other claims, of course, thus establishing the truth of the Quran and the Prophet for all of humanity. So a thorough analysis of the claims of the Quran is conducted over a passage of time. Now we have 1400 years, lots of events that have happened, a lot of data to analyze and uh, uh, the Quran in hand and even Hadith. So there should be an analysis wherein we can understand how, uh, you know, where is it all leading up to? The necessary conclusion then would be, number one, how could the Prophet perfectly describe these events in the future? And we're going to see that. We're just going to take one, just one. There's so many others that we could discuss. But just one event that is surrounding this uh, city of Jerusalem, the conclusion that will be drawn after a thorough analysis would be that, you know, it's just mind boggling. It's amazing how the Prophet could perfectly describe these events that are 1000 years after him. And the only logical and rational conclusion then would be to accept that the Prophet was divinely inspired by some super intelligence, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who knows and controls the historical and cosmological process. That's the only logical conclusion by any unbiased mind when you go through all of this analysis and you have enough of time uh, that has passed in order to see uh, with your own eyes, with your own ears and your minds to rationally process all of this, you have to conclude, you will have to conclude that this has to be from someone, the Prophet has to be divinely inspired, was divinely inspired by a super intelligence, somebody who knew this hist historical process, who literally was controlling this historical process, because this is not just forecasting, no, it's, you know, really accurate analysis, accurate description, bit by bit. So with this, what is going to happen, of course, when we take a very meticulous road to our analysis, you're going to experience three levels of certainty, yaqeen. Uh, these are all mentioned in the Quran and our scholars have used them in different ways. So first is ilm al yaqeen, which is, and by the way, all of this is even higher than iman. So you have Islam. Uh, which is just practice of Islam, the five daily prayers, uh, Ramadan, and, um, you know, a Hajj, and, you know, pronouncing the Kalima, that's the lower level. Then you go into Iman, where you believe in all of what Islam uh, has to offer. And then you take Al-Ihsan. So many scholars are of this opinion, this, this Yaqeen is higher than even belief, uh, than Iman. So this is, this is what is in store for you if you take this analysis and if you take, you know, this, the study of Islamic eschatology and analyzing world events, historical events through the lens of the Quran, even cosmological events, but that's another field. So what is Ilm al -Yakin? It's certainty derived by knowledge, intellectual analysis. So this is that sort of when you read a lot and you analyze, you're unbiased, you're doing your, uh, you know, analysis and rational analysis, the certainty that you will uh, derive through that, that is Ilm al -Yakin. So using Islamic eschatology, world events understood with perfect coherence. The moment you apply Islamic eschatology or Ilm al zaman to the world events, Everything makes sense. Everything looks like a very coherent flow. The historical process literally 
comes across as, and I mean, you can feel it, you can see it, that it's goal-directed, purpose-oriented, and it's not random. And what does that mean? If it's goal-directed, it's purpose-oriented, purpose entails, you know, a will, a willer, a willing agent. So it's moving with, with some laws, it's moving in a particular direction. Who uh, is, then the next question, of course, would be who is moving it in this, in this direction? And the question necessary conclusion would be the one who is, uh, you know, informing us of all of these events and giving us this coherence is truly divinely inspired. It cannot be a normal human being, not a historical figure. Uh, this is a prophet in the real uh, sense of the term. So the only way the Prophet would have had access to this knowledge has to be through divine communication. That is what comes after an analysis. And that is what we want to attempt. Ayn al-Yaqeen is the next level now. So certainty derived upon witnessing. Um, one is a lower level of certainty, which is just reading, intellectual analysis, rational thinking, and you get to a conclusion that, no, this has to be from a divine source. This, there's, you know, too much coherence and too much purpose orientation. This has to come from a divine agency uh, with, uh, you know, who is in control. But then another, uh, the higher level of yaqeen is ayn al yaqeen when you witness it, when you see it. So after a particular passage of time, when events occur exactly according to the Quran and the Hadith, witnessing those events would lead to a greater certainty. I mean, you're going to see with your own eyes the play out the actual manifestation of what the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi described. For example, let me give you an example. The most, you know, it's the most basic uh, hadith that, that is uh, regarding uh, the end times, which is Bedouins would compete with it, each other on the uh, how tall their buildings are in the Arab pe Peninsula, especially. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prophesied and he said you're going to see Bedouins compete with each other on the length of their buildings. This was in the seventh century. A person who is talking about the uh, you know Arab Peninsula which is barren dry. The poorest people, it's not even a civilization. It is nowhere near the Persian Empire or the Roman Empire. This, this blessed man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that particular time is telling us, and it's recorded, it, um, uh, this hadith is actually mutawatir, mutafakun alayhi, which means that many people heard this. So this is absolutely, you know, like authentic, where he said that you're going to see Bedouins compete with each other on the length of their buildings. Who could have known this? Or the way he describes Mecca, how you're going to see the buildings of Mecca would reach the height of the um, uh, mountains in Mecca. And you can go to Mecca and you can see this. It is a fascinating sight to even see how can you know somebody even see it. It's as if he saw it. And it was maybe he saw it completely because the way he described it was is absolutely impeccable. So that is Ayn al yaqeen when you see it with your own eyes. So before, maybe let's say a hundred years back, the uh, Arab uh, Peninsula was desert. You had Bedouins, you had no civilization almost, only in select few cities. And then you had a barren desert, nothing of the UAE, the, you know, Dubai, or uh, any one of these Emirates. And at that time, you would just have well, ilm al yaqeen you know, uh, maybe you knew this hadith if we were born a hundred years back. But now, in this very short period of time, we can actually witness it. So this is ayn al yaqeen And finally, the highest uh, level of certainty is absolute certainty, haqq al yaqeen When the subject, now the one who is witnessing this, is directly within the sphere of that particular uh, prophesied event. This is the highest form of certainty. When you are directly inside that event, you are fulfilling that prophecy yourself, 
and you know that you're doing this, that is the absolute uh, certainty. Uh, there are many scholars who explain this, this division of Yaqeen in uh, one example, which is basically there's a fire somewhere and you're just sitting at home and you hear from someone that there is a fire in your neighborhood. So that is ilm al -yaqeen. You can trust this person. This person uh, doesn't lie. So there is a fire, uh, you know, uh, somewhere in your neighborhood. But then ayn al -yaqeen is when you move out of your house, you go out and you see with your own eyes smoke coming out of uh, a house there. So you have with your own eyes, you've witnessed this. So this is ayn al -yaqeen. This is in the stage that we are in. Uh, if we go through this analysis, we actually can get this Ayn al -yaqeen level of certitude that we can actually see the Prophet Sallallahu truth manifesting out in uh, the world, in the historical process. Only he, and there is nobody else in the world, he is the only one who could, you know, who has accurately described the modern world, the current world, the historical events for us. And we're going to see that one of them, inshallah. And Hakul Yaqeen is when you're the one who's in the house, uh, God forbid, and you're the one and you can see it, you're in the house surrounded by flames. So this level of Yaqeen, Allahu Alam, this could be maybe, you know, for, a like we said, the people who are fulfilling these prophecies, or let's say when the time of uh, Isa alayhi salam comes and there would be Muslims who would witness that, who would be with him, who would see it all, all happening, and who would see, uh, you know, uh, the events in uh, Jerusalem and what's going to happen to the communities there. They, they are the ones who are going to possess Haqqul Yaqeen. Now, well, it's a very long hadith. I'm going to summarize this, but this is the core hadith that shows us the importance of Islamic eschatology or Ilm al Akhir Zaman. Because there are many people who have this misconception that, you know, maybe I don't feel. Uh, this is not my area of interest, Islamic eschatology. I would rather uh, concentrate on this particular area of fiqh, of maybe something like this or something like that, some other areas of usul or, uh, you know, there's so many areas to see. But this Islamic eschatology, not really my taste. There's some people who have this uh, sort of a misconception that maybe this field is just not, uh, you know, that important that you can choose and you can select. But this hadith uh, just demolishes that. We are told, and this is a very authentic hadith, like I said uh, in the previous slide, this is where uh, many, many Sahaba reported this event. The Prophet Sallallahu sitting with all of his companions in the masjid in Medina. A man comes in, very bright white clothes, not a sign of travel because if, when you travel in, at that time in um, uh, you know in the desert you're going to be covered in dust disheveled hair but completely fine very nice looking man comes in but nobody recognizes him so he can't be from medina but he doesn't look like he's traveled where did he come from people are shocked he sits next to the prophet he asks him four questions actually five so he says Oh, Muhammad, tell me about faith. Tell me about uh, Islam. Sorry, tell me about Islam. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ tells him that Islam is uh, to testify there's no God but uh, Allah. And Muhammad ﷺ is the messenger of Allah to establish prayer, to give charity, to fast the month of Ramadan, to perform pilgrimage to the house if possible. Then he the a man said, you have spoken truthfully. So he, he asks a question, but then he says, he sort of, you know, verifies and he says, you know, accepts the answer. Yes, you've chosen, you've spoken truthfully. And the companions are like surprised. So he asks and then he says that you're truthful. What kind of questioning is that? So then he says, the man says, tell me about faith. The Prophet ﷺ gives him the appropriate answer, which is faith is to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and all of that. So that is from Islam, then Iman. Then he says, again, you've spoken the truth. You, uh, he, then he asks the third question being, <clears throat> tell me about Al-Ihsan. So Islam, Iman, Al-Ihsan. The Prophet ﷺ says, Al-Ihsan, <clears throat> excuse me, 
is to worship Allah as if you see him. And if you do not see me, then surely see him, then surely he sees you. Then the man said, now the fourth question, this is of importance. He said, tell me about the final hour. The Prophet Sallallahu said, the one asked does not know more than the one who's asking. So there is, the Prophet Sallallahu is confirming that I know as much as you know. He doesn't say that I don't know. He doesn't say that I do know. That's a very mysterious answer that the Prophet Sallallahu says. The man then says, okay, tell me about its signs. And the Prophet gives him two signs. When there is a slave girl who will give birth to her mistress. That's one. So it has been understood in various ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Earlier Muslims had a very, very tough time understanding this hadith because they just couldn't understand how can a slave girl give birth to her mistress? So they only understood it as to me, maybe children are going to become very arrogant and very rude with their parents. But actually now we can appreciate as modern Muslims living in the scientific age, we can appreciate this uh, hadith more that we know you know, uh, um, how surrogacy works and IVF and how uh, artificial fertilization works. Mostly you have women uh, who are from very, very economically backward uh, communities being used as surrogate mothers. And we know that. And the, the second sign, so he mentions two signs, remember. The second sign is that you're going to see barefoot, naked and uh, uh, shepherds compete in the construction of tall buildings. So there it is. The Prophet answers his questions and then he, when the man leaves, he tells uh, his companions, this was Jibreel and he came to teach you your faith. So he, uh, the Prophet identified who this man was. What is that? Tell us, there's so many, I mean, scholars have spent like so, you know, they've, they've constructed a lot of analysis around this hadith because this is so meaning laden. But what we can take at least for our current discussion is that Ilmul Akhir Zaman is a central part of our deen because the Prophet ﷺ said that this was Jibreel. He came to teach you your deen, your religion. So Ilm al zaman is the fourth division or dimension or level of our faith. If our faith, our faith, our deen is, you know, if we could divide it into four or we could construct four levels, you're going to have Ilm al zaman at the last level. And actually, if you see it's after Al-Ihsan, that means you need to build a very high level of faith. Uh, to understand this um, area of study, uh, to actually appreciate it. And the best part is it's a two-way relationship. The mo more you understand Ilm al Zaman, the more it's going to add to your yaqeen, what we discussed before. And of course, you need yaqeen and you need Al-Ihsan to address and to approach Ilm al Zaman. Because if you don't understand and if you don't accept the Prophet Sallallahu and if you have this sort of uh, in, an inhibition, maybe a doubt or skepticism in your mind that how can a seventh century book explain uh, a 21st century you know, event? How can it do that? That is skepticism, that is doubt. Then Ilm al Zaman is not meant for you. It's meant for people who know for a fact that this is a miracle from Allah. The Quran is a miracle from Allah. And part of that miracle is that it is applicable till the end of time and it explains all things. That's what it's unlike all books. It's a living book. It speaks to you. It gives you the best explanation. And this is a man. May Allah preserve him and elevate his ranks, who
who has pioneered this field of study. And we can be grateful to him, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first, and then to him, uh, that firstly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us uh, with a scholar like this, and for making us live in a period like this, where we can understand all of these events that are happening. And then of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the one who hasn't thanked people hasn't thanked Allah. So we need to thank uh, Sheikh Imam Hussein for his pioneering work. You know, you have scholars who write brilliant books and who um, do amazing work, but then you have a next level of scholars who completely bring about, you know, they pioneer absolutely new fields of knowledge. And while Ilmul Akhir Zaman were, used to be a part of, um, hmm, I could have done that before. So while Ilmul uh, Akhir Zaman uh, could be, uh, used to be a part of the Hadith literature. So you had, it was completely, it was studied under Hadith. Uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein, may Allah bless him and protect him, he developed it into an independent field. And thanks to his education in international politics, he says that, you know, when I went to study in Geneva, he went to study international politics, I took my Quran with me, I took, which he meant in the sense symbolically, that I took the Quran uh, to analyze world events. And he, you know, uh, scored the first rank in his class, he says he attributes his success to the Quran because with the Quran, he could make sense of global events. It, it just, you know, he could connect the dots and there was absolute coherence in whatever is happening, something that is missing in a secular study. So he says, now with our current subject, it is only through the Quran that we can understand the strange events happening in the world and especially in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the key to the understanding of the historical process. That's how important the city is. And that's how important these events are. This is not just, you know, you know it is heart wrenching, it's heartbreaking. Uh, whatever is happening in the Holy Land, but from a completely different perspective, it is absolutely critical uh, for us as Muslims to take note of whatever is happening in that city, in that region, because there lies the key to our future. So he says, it is not possible for anyone to truly understand the modern world unless one can also penetrate the reality of Jerusalem today. So that is a very, uh, that's a very strong statement there, but we're going to see how that is so true. And then, you know, the frustration is that why don't we use the Quran? generally to understand world events. Why don't our scholars do that? Why is the Quran not central to our foreign or domestic, our economic policies, our social movements in, in Muslim countries, Muslim communities worldwide? You have, uh, you know, Zionists uh, who are, you know, the Israeli uh, population, they, Israel actually, and many people, they don't know, Israel is, uh, you could say one of, uh, I think the only country in the world that uses eschatology as their foreign policy. Literally, you can see that many analysts have uh, you know, noted that and they have their own eschatology. But to note you know, Jewish uh, eschatology, then you have Christian es eschatology as well. But we as in, in Islam, we have the most extensive, the biggest, you know, uh, work done on eschatology, the biggest field and the most amount of uh, literature, which is in the form of uh, the Quran and even uh, the Hadith on uh, eschatology on the end times. So we should have been the foremost in using this. But unfortunately, this attitude towards the Quran is not there. Uh, the first European Prime Minister of Israel, uh, David Ben-Gurion, he said, that the Bible is our deed to the land of Israel. So you can see the man, the, the, all of them, they use the Old Testament, the Torah, to construct much of their public discourse, their foreign policy, even their domestic policy. Well, a distortion of it, of course, but then at least they're, you know, attempting. Now, 
this is where I want you to see the difference, why a, an Islamic analysis is needed. The, here in front of you, you have like a chart of a secular, a historical analysis of the Holy Land. So if you go to a university or if you watch a show or you know, any sort of historical analysis, you, you want to approach uh, the history of the Holy Land, Palestine. This is how a secular analysis looks like. It's just, you know, dots, literally, doesn't make sense, incoherent. You have the Canaanites before, uh, you know, uh, before uh, Jesus Christ, 2000 years before Jesus Christ, then you have the Philistines who were the ancient people who lived in Palestine. And that is was a cultural name uh, that was given to ancient people who lived in Palestine and the Israelites. Then the Israelites became the descendants of Ibrahim salam, through Ishaq and through Yaqub, uh, Jacob. Jacob was also called Israel. So these were Israelites who uh, shifted to uh, the Holy Land, to Palestine. And, uh, you know, in, in it's, it's absolutely saddening that uh, today's uh, modern uh, Israelites, uh, people who live in the state of Israel, actually, you know, consider themselves to be uh, this, the, 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 you know, the clash that happened between the Philistines and the Israelites, they actually think that it's still on, whereas the equations are completely, have completely been changed. The current Israelites, are, they resemble more of the Pharaonic and the, you know, Goliath rather than David. And we're going to go into that if you can't really, you know. Okay, so then you have the Assyrian, the Babylonian people taking over Palestine. Then you have, just, just go over this. Does it make sense? At least it's just, you know, a big chart with a lot of names doesn't really, you can't really have any coherence. Then you have the Romans, the Byzantians, and finally you have the Rashidun. So there uh, you can see uh, the Muslims taking control of uh, Palestine. You had crusaders in the middle, and then again, Muslims. And then again, the British took it over from the Ottoman Muslims and then gave it to, uh, you know, uh, constructed the state of Israel. That is a secular analysis doesn't make sense. Random, the historical process looks like a random flow of events. Nothing makes sense, just random dots here and there, and people coming in and taking the land, then going out, other people coming in and, you know, uh, taking over the land and why is this happening? Why should it happen? Why do these people fade off? Why do, the, doesn't make sense. So we're going to attempt what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a secular analysis of uh, Jerusalem. And then once we are done with that, I want you to see, does, does it make sense to you? Does it, you know, uh, sort of, can you uh, find any coherence? Can you find any sort of connection between two events? It just looks like a random flow of things. So you start with Abraham. The story starts with Abraham, even though there were people before Abraham in that place. But let's start our story with Abraham, uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, his son Isaac, Jacob. They settled in the Holy Land. They shifted to the Holy Land uh, when Ibrahim alayhi salam. So I'm just taking the secular analysis and also even Jewish and Christian sources. I haven't used Islamic, uh, the Islamic analysis. That will be inshallah in the next session. Then you go from, they, they've been settled uh, in the Holy Land. Famine forces the Israelites to emigrate to Egypt. That's when they move to Egypt. Uh, Egypt. From the Holy Land, they go to Egypt. Then from, the e from Egypt, when there's enormous amounts of you know, oppression on the Israelite people by the Pharaoh, uh, if we remember some of that, uh, Moses, it's Prophet Moses, who leads the Israelites from Egypt back to this holy land but they don't enter the holy land what they do is they wander in the desert and there are reasons for that we're going to go into that so that's where the torah is revealed and they keep wandering for 40 years during these 40 years musa passes away 
Then after that, the Israelites settle in the land of Israel. Suddenly they enter the land of Israel. You have the first monarchy, the Jewish empire, a Jewish state. Now it's not really the Jewish state. This is an Islamic state because these are believers. They believe in the one God. They are believing in the prophets, right? So this is an, the first Islamic state that is built, uh, a monarchy uh, with Saul. We know Saul as Talut uh, from the Quran. He's the first king. Then power shifts to Dawood, David's kingdom. Uh, the first temple is built by Suleiman, his son, and this is the national and the spiritual center of the Jewish people. Amazingly, what happens is then uh, we enter, this period is called the first temple destruction. Why? Because this whole kingdom gets divided into two. Israel is crushed by a different kind of people, the Assyrians. The 10 tribes are exiled. They are forced to flee. Uh, the lost tribes, uh, these are called the lost tribes of uh, you know, uh, the Israelites. And as many people speculate, and there is quite evidence from Islamic sources also that uh, the Pakhtuns, and the Kashmiris, uh, these are the lost, one of uh, two of the lost, or maybe one of the lost tribes of uh, Israelites. They settle in that area. And well, they go uh, throughout the land. Then you have uh, Judah. So these are two places, Judah and Israel. Judah being conquered by the Babylonians and Jerusalem and the first temple is destroyed. As you can see on the screen, it's completely raised to ground. The temple is completely raised. This was the masjid that was created, that was built by Suleiman Islam, raised to ground. The Jews are exiled and even enslaved by the Babylonian uh, forces. Why? We don't really understand why, because this is a secular analysis. You just have information. You don't have knowledge through a secular analysis. Then suddenly what happens is we're talking about all of this period is before Jesus Christ, uh, Isa alayhi salam. So this is 538 years before Isa alayhi salam. All of these events, so BCE is before Christ, Christian era. So you have uh, the uh, Persian Empire, then defeating the Babylonian Empire. The Jews then return from Babylonia to Jerusalem. The temple is rebuilt. Okay, so a different empire uh, is built. They defeat Babylonians, they take the Jews back, go back to the Holy Land, the temple is rebuilt. This is the second time, this is the sec second temple period. Then it's conquered by Alexander. Uh, you have Roman rule there for some time, but they let them live, they have their own uh, you know, uh, temple. And suddenly now we are moving close to the time. Now, 63 years before uh, Jesus Christ, you have complete absolute Roman control over the area, over the Holy Land. And then you have the birth of Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam is born within uh, you know, 20 years. He declares that he is the promised Messiah. And this is the ministry of Jesus of Naz Nazareth as in he lives for these years. So he is the prophet uh, in that period. And then suddenly what happens is in, after this period, after 33 years, he is you know, uh, according to the Christian and the Jewish uh, view, he is crucified. Of course, as Muslims, we don't believe that. Uh, but that's what happens. Literally within 30 years, the moment he's, uh, they attempt to crucify him, literally within 30 years, you have a Jewish revolt, you have some sort of anarchy in the Holy Land, and suddenly you have the Roman empire that was living very peacefully uh, there controlling the holy land suddenly something happens they destroy the temple they raise it to ground except for one wall that was left there and uh, the second temple completely destroyed the jews are forced to flee completely banned from this place they cannot return to this place this is a ban that has been put for uh, the uh, Jews to, re they cannot return to the city of Jerusalem. Then you see on uh, the city of Jerusalem, you have Christian control. And as long as the Christians ruled, which is, uh, uh, you know, 300 years from 313 uh, to 636 CE, that's a lot of, you know, time, they ruled this area, the Jews could not come back. 
and they could just not you know reclaim this land as their own they could come back as tourists they could come back as you know pilgrims uh, not in the during the christian period in the arab period in the muslim period when the muslims took control that's when they allowed jews to come back as as pilgrims as some people even settled but they could never reclaim it as their own the way it was their state never then you had a brief period of the crusader domination so crusades were a western christian wars against uh, Muslims for the control of the Holy Land. So, and then we know how Salahuddin al-Ayubi took Jerusalem back. You had Mamluk rule for some time, again, Muslim rule. So you can see that like the Muslim rule is more, but that's not the point. The point is, we're gonna get into that. It's not about who ruled Jerusalem more. The point is that who respected Jerusalem, who understood the worth of Jerusalem, who, who is worthy of Jerusalem is the only one who takes it at, as holy, who doesn't you know, uh, uh, massacre people and desecrate holy places. Those are the people who deserve the holy land, who, do, who, who don't open restaurants and clubs and bars around uh, you know, the holy area. These are the people who deserve control over this holy place. Then you had Ottoman rule, which was from uh, the 16th century, 1517 to 1917. In this period, now you have to understand the Muslims were very uh, you know, lenient with uh, the Jewish, uh, with all communities. So you have Jews actually uh, migrating, emigrating to the Holy Land. But again, they cannot reclaim it as their own. They can just live there. And they are fleeing persecution from Russia. Uh, Ottoman sultans were very, you know, with open arms, uh, accepting people from uh, you know, Jewish people who suffered enormous amounts of uh, oppression in Russia, especially because Russia is, uh, was and is uh, Orthodox Christian. So you have to understand what's the, you know, if, if uh, those of you who don't understand what the main bone of contention between uh, Jews and Christians is, is that the uh, Christians uh, understand Isa alayhi salam to be the Messiah, as well as the son of God. Okay, and for the Jewish population, they reject that completely. And not only do they reject that, they actually, uh, you know, sort of insult uh, Isa alayhi salam, saying that he wasn't, he was, God forbid, may Allah forgive me for even saying this, an illegitimate child. And they slander uh, Maryam alayhi salam, who was the purest of the pure, uh, you know, the best of womankind. So you can imagine, on the one hand, you have people like believing he's almost God. And on the other hand, so there, there was always this, this massive amount of hatred between the two communities. Then suddenly you have a Zionist Congress being built, which uh, with uh, Theodore Herzl, who was the first Zionist who founded this uh, movement. Remember, Zionism is the political movement to bring back the Jews to the Holy Land. And then throughout this period, you have uh, the uh, you know, migration of Jews from Russia, from Poland, wherever they are facing uh, persecution and pogroms and, you know, uh, all of those uh, things, they are moving back to the Holy Land, but they're coming back not as people reclaiming the land, but just as people fleeing persecution. Suddenly, you have the British mandate, which is the British take control. They occupy the Holy Land. They fight with the Ottoman Empire for many, many centuries. They are fighting against the Ottoman Empire, weaken, trying to weaken it. And then finally, they uh, fight a war. They uh, take control and they occupy uh, the Holy Land. This is, uh, you know, 400 years uh, rule of the Ottoman Empire is ended. And the British foreign minister, Balfour, he pledges support for the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Why, you know, why something like this would happen? Uh, the, these are Christian people, and why are they doing this? And why are they, you know, in this whole period of 2000 years, why now that 
uh, you know, this, this whole passion of building a Jewish national home in Palestine suddenly becomes an obsession with uh, Britain, with the Jewish community. And 1948, you have the end of the British mandate and they uh, proclaim the state of Israel is actually established on 14th of May. So this is a secular sort of walk through uh, history, but there are various problems with this secular analysis, which is the absurdity of history. Does it make sense? So why should, let's talk about this obsession. Why would a secularized, essentially godless Europe? So we have to understand at the, uh, from the last uh, century, Europe is completely secular. It's not, you know, it's not religious, it's not, they don't identify as a religious civilization. So why would a secularized and essentially godless Europe choose to persist in pursuing Christian Europe's 1000 year old obsession of liberating the Holy Land? This is the Crusaders. Why are they acting like Crusaders? And a very interesting thing is, when the British take over uh, the Holy Land, you have the British general who walks into Jerusalem. And he, he uh, remarks, he says, today the Crusades have ended, which is very absurd. This is a secular <clears throat> civilization now. It's not that Christian civilization that was fighting for the cross. So why are they obsessed with making a Jewish home Christian people making a Jewish home. The success in itself is absurd. The final success of an essentially godless secular Europe in liberating the Holy Land in 1917. How did they become successful? We know that this is in itself, this, this requires an explanation, an analysis. You have a secular Europe liberating a holy place. Why? And for people, who are, well, their rivals till yesterday. Again, why would European Christians be the only Christians who would never be obsessed, who would uh, always be obsessed with uh, the desire to liberate the Holy Land, not Eastern Christians. So Christians are of various kinds. And Muslims, uh, you know, the Christian communities that live in the Islamic world are one of the oldest communities. Many of those communities can trace their origin back to, uh, you know, Maryam alayhi salam. That's how old uh, the Christian communities in Syria, in uh, Lebanon, in Egypt are. Why didn't they, you know, why weren't they obsessed with liberating the Holy Land and taking the Holy Land? Why weren't Eastern Orthodox Russians from, uh, you know, uh, Christians from Russia, from Bulgaria, from Eastern Europe, why weren't they, uh, you know, obsessed? Why only these particular Christians, the Western Christians, who are these people? Uh, what is their origin? So these are very important questions. Only when you ask the right questions, you're gonna get right answers. And then another absurdity is the mysterious conversion of European tribes to Judaism. Why would a European people convert to Judaism and then be obsessed with the mission of liberating the Holy Land and bringing the Israelite Jews back to that Holy Land by hook or by crook? So what do I mean by that? Jews uh, essentially are of two uh, categories, and these are broad categories. You have the Israelite Jews, the Oriental Jews, like these are people who are ethnically Jewish, Banu Ishaq, Banu Israel, those. Those are the ones who lived, for the most part, in, in Iraq, uh, you, you know, in areas uh, like that, and some of them even abroad. But then you have a completely, and these are people who look almost like us, Asians, you know, South Asians, Arabs, they look like us. But then you have a different Jewish population, which are, they are European Jewish population. They are converts to Judaism. So they are white uh, people, uh, blonde hair, and they're Europeans, and they're converts to Ju Judaism. So it is these, and these are Ashkenazi, they're called Ashkenazi Jews, or uh, Khazar Jews, uh, they're called historically. So these two broad categories, between these two broad categories, you have the European Jews who are converts, suddenly they convert to Judaism, suddenly. You know, uh, and even though Judaism is not really Judaism, is an ethnicity, 
it, it isn't like uh, Christianity or Islam, which is a missionary religion. But suddenly you find these people, a huge population of European tribes, nomadic tribes, suddenly converting into Judaism. And then once they have converted to Judaism, within a few centuries, they have this passion, this, this, you know, this sort of Oh, can you hear me? Sure. I was scared. Am I alive? Yes, I'm alive. So suddenly you have these people who are obsessed with uh, getting. <clears throat> getting uh, Israelite Jews back, the main Oriental Jewish population back to the Holy Land. It's mysterious, it's absurd. Why would you do that? Why do you want to do that? Okay. Then finally, you have something like a Zionist alliance, a secular Europe so obsessed with assisting European Jews in the restoration of a religious state founded more than 2000 years earlier by prophets, David and Solomon. So a secular Europe wants to establish a religious state that existed like thousands of years back and that was created by prophets. And then finally, return after 2000 years. This requires an analysis. How can people who have been barred from a place, and in their own language, if you go and speak to any religious uh, scholar from the Jewish community, they'll tell you it was God who threw us out. It was God who made that happen. And it was God who sort of uh, exiled us from uh, the Holy Land. And suddenly, after 2000 years, you have the same people who were banned from that city entering back and not only entering back as tourists or as pilgrims, but taking over that land, establishing a state that existed 2000 years back and establishing, uh, you know, uh, that uh, kingdom that ex existed with prophets, the prophets that uh, of their community. And there you go, we see the establishment of a Jewish state after 2000 years. The question is, why would a scattered, impoverished, and oppressed people establish a cultural and national state after 2,000 years? Israel and the most, uh, according to me, this is the most mind-boggling and absurd thing, is why would Israel become a superpower? Okay, it's one thing getting the Jewish population back. It's one thing even establishing a state, even though that's absurd. It's one thing, you know, getting it all back, establishing the state, secular people, establishing a religious state, all of that. But then that particular state then becomes a superpower. This is by far one of the most big, the biggest mysteries that we have in contemporary history. Secular analysis cannot attempt to understand that. So, I mean, look at this. You have, in less than 100 years, how did the Jewish community change so much? On the left-hand side, you have uh, Jew the Jewish community, immigrants from Russia and from Europe, fleeing persecution, entering in uh, Muslim lands, and we know they were welcomed with you know, given a very warm welcome by Muslim people as well as the establishment. And then within 100 years, just 100 years, there is a massive shift. You, uh, Israel is now competing and even ahead, if you go into, you know, tech news and you start uh, reading on the kind of, kind of technology that they have when it comes to armaments, ammunition, when it comes to cyber technology and spyware, when it comes to even biotechnology. This is 
you know, it just, it's so absurd if you uh, go ahead with a secular analysis. How can uh, this happen? Why should it happen? So let me give you an example just to understand the absurdity of this. Imagine if the Rohingya become a, a global superpower in the next few decades. Look at the Rohingya. They are one of the most persecuted communities in the world. And if I were to tell you, you know what, in the next 100 years, you're going to see these people ruling the world, having their own state, and then creating technology that is, that is you know, beyond perception, maybe let's say teleportation, because a hundred years back, spyware and cyber technology was completely out of the picture. But now uh, Israel can, you know, they, 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 their firms can track every person on the planet. That's how much capacity that they have. And that's the kind of technology that they have and the kind of weapons that they have created and the kind of biotechnology and the viruses and the bacteria that they have the ability to create. It is unimaginable. How can one do that in one uh, hundred years, except that there has to be what a religious minded person would say, a divine uh, intervention in all of this, a divine will and a divine purpose behind all of this. So the only book that can help us answer these questions is the Quran. This is the absurdity of history. The only book that can give us this coherence is the Quran and the only man who can give us the best explanation is the Prophet and we'll see that with our own eyes the Prophet said it in his own words in the seventh century so analyzing history secularly is random dots doesn't make sense this event happens this event happens this event ha happens and just happens the only thing that we can do is maybe connected with the event prior to it or give some sort of a you know uh, absurd uh, explanation, but essentially we cannot make sense of. Excuse me, please. I'm getting. I hope you can hear me. And but the moment you apply uh, an Islamic analysis, that helps us in connecting the dots. It fortifies our Iman, our faith, and the historical process validates then the truth of Islam. That is what happens when you, uh, uh, you know, take this, this the, the Islamic analysis and you apply it on anything, be it cosmological events, be it science, be it uh, his, history, be it world events, economics, but this time we're going to talk about this particular area. So just briefly, we are ending uh, our presentation here. Inshallah, I want to continue it in a next session. But just to give you a taste of what the next session is going to look like, because we said the Prophet Sallallahu is the only person and the Quran is the only book that can explain to us, that can remove this absurdity from the, the historical process and can explain to us why things like this would happen but with one term literally he just gave us one term and with that we can build the whole narrative up he said there would be a false messiah who is the, the messiah a messiah is not like a regular prophet a messiah is a very powerful figure somebody who uh, you know uh, there are different definitions of it but somebody who will validate the claim of a belief system so uh, the christians believe in uh, the messiah uh, the muslims believe in the messiah and we are the, the largest community in the world which is christians plus muslims believe that the messiah is isa alayhi salam uh, whereas the Jews reject him. So, but the Messiah must do, do four things, uh, you know, uh, before he is declared as um, the Messiah. This is something that uh, we have even uh, in uh, the Islamic tradition, in the Christian tradition, as well as in the Jewish tradition. What are the characteristics of the false Messiah? And listen to this. I'm just attempting a little bit of an analysis. I'm not really going uh, deep into it because I just want to give you a taste of how coherent then the historical process will look if we take uh, the Islamic uh, analysis on the subject. So the Prophet says that he will be a Jew. That means he will uh, claim to be the promised Messiah. 
Okay, so he can only be the promised Messiah, this Jewish man who's going to come in the future. He can only, uh, you know, proclaim to be the promised Messiah if he fulfills these conditions. And he'll have to liberate the Holy Land from non-Jewish control. There you go. We can understand why there was this obsession with liberating the Holy Land from uh, the, you know, Muslim control, non-Jewish control. He's going to establish the state of Israel. So we understand why the British mandate, 1948, why would something like this happen? He would bring back the Jews uh, to the Holy Land. So we can understand why after 2000 years, a very peculiar event in history, that you have a population that was barred divinely from a city is being returned to the Holy Land. They're re reclaiming that city as their own. And he's going to make the state of Israel the ruling state in the world. This is by far one of the most absurd things. Literally, if we had, just imagine, if we had this uh, presentation, uh, I would say just 20 years back, no, don't even go uh, further than that, just 20 years back, there would be people who would be like, this is absurd. I mean, Israel is a tiny, tiny little country. Okay, yes, they do get a lot of funding from the US, but that, that will not make them even, uh, you know, more advanced than the US, which is, you know, it makes sense. Yes, of course, you can get aid. There's so many countries that get aid. Okay, let's say a lot of aid. But then what are the chances of you becoming even greater and even more powerful than the country that's giving you aid? So uh, and I've had these conversations with so many people before, and they just can't, you know, process how can Israel be a superpower just a few years back. But now we see with, with the pandemic as well. I mean, Israel was the first uh, country that, you know, uh, vaccinated its uh, population. It, it's a leader in communication technology, a leader in uh, spy, uh, cyber technology. It's a, it's a nuclear power. And this is what it makes to be a uh, superpower. This is all, these are all the things that you need to be a superpower. And what is a superpower? A superpower is a ruling state. A ruling state is uh, a state that can impose its will onto other nations, that can do whatever it likes to do, and nobody can stop them from doing this. For example, the US would just enter into Libya and can enter into Afghanistan, and nobody can stop the US from doing anything. The state of Suleiman salam, was just, of course, these are unjust and oppressive, but the state of Suleiman salam, was also a ruling state because we know from the Quran that when he sends the uh, you know, uh, invitation to the queen of Sheba, that is Bilqis, he doesn't say, you know, he literally orders them, you need to believe in this message. What are you doing? you know, worshiping the sun. So he imposes the will of this nation onto a, uh, another nation. That is the core characteristic of a ruling state. And we uh, are seeing literally Israel being a ruling state. It can do whatever it wants. It Nobody uh, is holding Israel to account. And this is going to increase and increase, of course, an oppressive, oppressive ruling state, but nevertheless a ruling state. And then the Messiah will have to construct the Temple of Solomon, this, this masjid, it, uh, the Temple of Solomon on the location of Masjid al-Aqsa. So all of these characteristics, when you take this, this is all from the Hadith and even from the Quran, then only can you understand, okay, so whatever the Jew, uh, you know, whatever the uh, British did, and whatever the Zionists did, and even before them, the Crusaders did. This is a very long process. It's more than, uh, you know, uh, how many years is it? Well, more than 600 years, uh, uh, you know, a historical process that is in front of our eyes. And this is what is happening. But inshallah, in the next session, what we are going to understand is that while the false messiah is one term, one person, but then we see that all of these centuries uh, and all of this time, how does this work out? And these are the dimensions in Islamic eschatology. The one primary characteristic to understand Islamic eschatology is that you cannot 
literally understand a day as a 24 hour period, no way. Uh, in Islamic eschatology, a day could be thousands of years, a day could be hundreds of years. So we're gonna do that inshallah in our next session. And to close, uh, again, with uh, Sheikh Imran Hussain, who is a pioneer in this field, and his book, The Jerusalem in the Quran, is a literally a masterpiece when it comes to an analysis of the modern age, especially with regards to Jerusalem. Highly recommended if you haven't read it already. It's available on the internet. He says, Israel's wicked oppression continues to intensify every day. Israel will soon reach the pinnacle of false glory when she becomes the ruling state in the world, which is actually happening before our eyes. This is Ayn al uh, The world is witnessing the beginning of the end for the imposter Jewish state of Israel. So what this is this is something this is something that needs an extensive discussion because what we are seeing the two people who are seeing the same thing happening, one population sees it to be like, yay, we are going to be the a superpower and a ruling state. But from our perspective, what we are seeing, this is going to be the biggest, the biggest deception that a community, a global community has ever, ever witnessed. That what they feel is their pinnacle of glory essentially would be divine punishment and divine destruction because this is not the the you know uh, the real islamic state of, of uh, that was constructed the by the prophets uh, sulaiman alayhi salam this is an imposter just like the messiah would be an imposter not really the messiah even the state is an imposter this is built on blood and uh, you know oppression so, but they, in their deception, they feel this is the best thing that could have happened. This is our golden age. We are returning as a golden age. This is essentially uh, ambush. And if there is, uh, there are intelligent Jewish people, and well, there are. You see, the biggest, uh, you know, opposition to the state of Israel is from the Jewish community. They, what they say is that. We need to get out of this place before a divine punishment occurs because they know we are not allowed to construct a state before God allows us to do that. We are to live in exile. This is the Orthodox Jewish position on this area. They're well learned. So you could understand the Holy Land then is not a place, a ruling state for the Jewish people. The Holy Land is literally an ambush, you know, like you have uh, an ambush being set up, a trap. Whoever, people are thinking, okay, there's a nice buffet here, we're going to rule the world, everything's going to be good, we're going to be powerful. Essentially, everybody who is there would eventually be trapped. And then what would come next would be divine punishment. This is not only from Islamic sources, even their own sources say this, that a state for, a, uh, for the Jewish people before God allows it before there is a plain sign from God is an invitation to destruction and punishment. And well, we know that as well. Now. So to summarize our very long discussion, and inshallah there's going to be a part two of this where we go deep into a, an analysis is that an Islamic analysis is a must for various reasons. Number one, a protection against the great tribulations of the last age. We discussed that. Things are gonna get very difficult for yourself, for your, for your physical being, for your mental being, for your spiritual being, and for your actual success in the afterlife, which is the most important for any religious person. That, for that, you need to analyze. So it's not just a thing like it's interesting. Like there are many people who go to Islamic eschatology because it's interesting. Or maybe they are emotionally sort of, you know, right now we want to hear things against maybe the oppressors in the Holy Land. So we want to know. No, this is a must. This is an obligation to Islamically analyze historical events. 
to understand, to have, uh, to inculcate patience. Because when you don't understand, how will you be patient? In uh, Surah Al-Kahf, we are told, Hidr alayhi salam, he tells Musa, he gives us a principle. He says, وَكَيْفَ تَصْبِرُوا عَلَى مَا لَمْ تُهِدْ بِهِ خُبْرًا and how are you going to be patient with something that you do not know, you do not have any knowledge about uh, or any understanding about? So for patience, because things are going to be difficult, we need knowledge, understanding. What's going to happen next? Who's going to win at the end? That inculcates when we have that understanding, we can see that with our own eyes now playing out, we would be, uh, be able to be patient. And secondly, the highest level is then you can even develop and grow your iman through it. You can, this uh, Islamic eschatology is a very, very easy route to building uh, one's spirituality and to building one's iman because what you're seeing is going to be literally from your own eyes. You're going to see the truth of the Prophet وسلم, that the Prophet وسلم, the only way uh, he could have explained all of these events in the world so accurately is that he was truly, truly uh, the Prophet of God and divinely inspired. You can, you, it would be experiential your iman would be experiential. And finally, Jerusalem, we have to understand, is the heart of end times. It's not some, you know, it's, it's not like some other uh, city that is undergoing oppression. Like, for example, we had so many Muslim uh, cities and uh, nations that were colonized by the British. Then they were bombarded by the Americans. But then Jerusalem is very critical to understand all of what is happening in the world. Why is all of this happening? We need to understand Jerusalem and the historical process. Then when we go through this uh, Islamic analysis, we understand the historical process is divinely engineered. It is goal directed. It's purpose oriented. It is not random like your secular education would have you believe or your TV shows would have you believe. This is something that is moving with a goal. And if you don't, you know, join this caravan and if you don't appreciate uh, the, the, you know, the meanings that it carries, then you're the one or I am the one who is, um, you know, who is not worthy, who is losing, who's a loser in all of this. We're the one, there's nothing that is going to be, you know, uh, lessened from, from the caravan. It's us who are uh, at fault. And then we are depriving ourselves of great meaning, of great benefits and great blessings. So we are moving step by step towards the global validation and the establishment of the truth of Islam. This is why an Islamic analysis is important, because we need to see this. You see, one is to believe, okay, I believe I'm Muslim because my parents are Muslim, or I come from a Muslim uh, you know, uh, culture, but one is to actually feel Islam, to actually see with your own self the uh, you know, playing out of the truth of Islam, the actual establishment of the truth of Islam. And that can only happen when you analyze the historical process. And you, uh, you see that step by step, whatever the Prophet said, everything that the Quran said, everything that the Prophet said is actually happening before our eyes. And that is it. Uh, so I would thank you enough. And before I leave you, I want to share with you uh, little something which is a, t, uh, a, pro, a promo uh, for uh, our upcoming online course so if you would like to know the subject islamic eschatology in a deeper sense and in a deeper way and you know academically sort of understand it what we are trying to do is build courses that are you know sort of uh, tailored to lay audiences, lay Muslims, as well as people who want to develop this field, inshallah, academically as a separate field of study. And for that, uh, we are, inshallah, uh, one of our upcoming courses is um, Iqbal, The Last Day, and Gog and Magog. So, uh, you know, one of the brilliant 
uh, scholars of Islam, brilliant philosophers of Islam, uh, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, he was one of the few, very few, I think, be, you know, literally the only one who understood a hundred years back, it's not a joke, even way before Sheikh Imran Hussain was even born. And of course we know that Sheikh Imran Hussain is the pioneer, he built and established this field. Uh, but what we want to go back a bit yeah, and go to even uh, you know, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, how he was successful in identifying that we are living in the world order of Gog and Magog. He identifies through just three or four lines of poetry that the world order that is in control of the entire globe is that of Gog and Magog, uh, which uh, roughly, uh, if you were to ask me, I would say we live in a dual pole world order. On one side, you have the US and allies, which of course now the, uh, the state of Israel is going to take the leadership, the US and NATO with its uh, armed wing, so European allies. And on the other side, you have China and its allies. So these are the two uh, sort of opposing powers, the dual polled world order that is uh, the world order of Gog and Magog. Uh, but there are many people who don't understand this, who say Gog and Magog are still somewhere uh, inside the earth and all of that. And they use really bad methodology. They take a Hadith and they put it over the Quran. That is, they elevate the Hadith over the Quran, which is uh, not a correct thing to do. And they mistranslate one of the hadith, uh, one of the words in that hadith, which is ba'asa to mean release. Ba'asa is to send, not to release. Both the Jal and Gog and Magog were released in the lifetime of the Prophet. The Prophet suspected a Jewish boy, Ibn Sayyad, to be the Dajjal. The, the Why did he do that? Uh, because he was trying to tell us from my time the Jal has been released. And the number two, uh, Gog and Magog, it was in Medina that he saw a dream and he said that the barrier of Zulkarnain that is holding Gog and Magog back. And Gog and Magog are the, you know, the worst, the most powerful people that Allah has ever created and the most corrupt people. So he said they're the ones, they have been released in his lifetime. So I want to show you this trailer, this promo uh, from our upcoming online Course. On December 11th, General Allenby enters Jerusalem on foot out of respect for the city. The streets of Jerusalem echoed with the footsteps of a colonizing army. <laughs> It had been a long road to Jerusalem, one filled with lies, deception, and bloodshed. It started with the Crusaders, and the British completed it. A thousand year holy war to occupy the world's oldest city. General Allenby, who was in command of the British army, takes over Jerusalem in December 1917. Thousands of miles away, a Muslim sage and a prominent thinker of the last century openly declares in lines of Urdu poetry that this was the biggest sign of the last hour. He says, All the forces of Gog and Magog have been set loose on the world. Let the Muslim eye turn their attention to the word Yansilu. This served as a great warning that the world was now in the full grasp of Gog and Magog. But who are Gog and Magog, and what does Jerusalem have to do with them? These questions may just open the doors of the last hour.
And there you have it. Inshallah, if you are interested in learning more and uh, understanding the subject of Islamic eschatology or Ilmul Aqir Zaman, you're going to find a link uh, to our courses, uh, basically a link uh, where you can sign up to the website and inshallah you'll be informed you'll be mailed uh, when the course starts and inshallah you can subscribe to the course and uh, i pray that this discussion was beneficial to all of us and may allah reward us rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samiul alim wa tub alayna innaka anta tawabu rahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik ashadu allah ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk